Hi, my name is Ben Jacobson from Jacobson Salt Co. And you're listening to Ingredient Insiders. This is Ingredient Insiders. I'm John Magazzino. I'm Andrea Parkins. On each episode of Ingredient Insiders, we will be talking with chefs, authors, and food lovers about their favorite ingredients. And then we talk to the producer of that ingredient, and we learn about its history, how it's made, and why chefs love to use it in their restaurants. Today's episode is going to be one for the ages, Andrea. I can't I just, believe it took I just five have seasons, that feeling. John. I have that or four feeling. Seasons. I have that feeling because we have one of our favorite people in the food world, one of the most prolific cookbook authors in the history of cookbooks. Melissa Clark from the New York Times is going to be joining us today to talk about salt. I mean, it's the foundational ingredient in all kitchens. I don't think you could walk into any kitchen in the entire universe that doesn't have salt in it. You cannot cook without salt. Without salt. We're also going to have Ben Jacobson of Jacobson Salt based out in Oregon. Um, this is an incredible story too. Ben, you know, created this salt production company and he's making some of the finest, I, I, is it safe to call them sea salts? Yeah, flake sea salt. Yeah. And so we've got Ben here to talk about salt. We've got Melissa here to talk about salt. Um, How I many just, salts do you have in your pantry, John? My pantry has, let me just jog my memory. Okay. I've got a... My go-to salt is diamond crystal kosher mm -hmm. salt. That's kind of my all-purpose war course. That goes in my pasta water. That goes into most, you know, if I'm making vinaigrettes, that goes into most everything I'm making. Then I also have the blue canister of La mm -hmm. fine sea salt from France. And I use that um, when I'm, you know, I sprinkle that on a lot of stuff before cooking. Yep. I find that the La Boline salt uh, in the blue canister, the fine one, it coats food very evenly. Yes. The proportion, the, the canister, like, you know, a lot of the times, I, I don't know if you do this at home, I have a salt pig. Yeah. Which is kind of like a vessel that holds salt. Yeah, I have a salt it, goose, actually. Salt goose. Mine yeah. actually looks like an egg. Actually, um, mine's a chicken now that I think about it. Right. I don't know why I said goose. It's, but, I got it in Colombia. It's made out of glass. Yeah, mine is, I don't even know where I got it, but... um. The La Baleen, I feel like when you use this, you keep it in the canister and you shake it. Well, you know what the beauty of La Baleen is, in my opinion, especially the fine? It never clumps. It yep. never cakes up. It comes out evenly. They don't add any funky stuff to it as far as I know. It's pure sea salt. But yes, to your point, you can sprinkle it on evenly and it almost kind of melts right into exactly. the food. So you don't have any, you know, when you don't want texture or you don't want something yeah. that's not melting quickly into the food. But the Jacobson salt, you know, it's more of a finishing salt. Yep. And it's going to add uh, flavor and really a lot of texture. That crunch that I personally love on top of dishes, that's what you're going to use a Jacobson right. salt for. Well, I was going to finish telling you about all the different salts. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll talk about We're going to talk about it with talk Melissa. With Melissa, we'll talk about that. You know, that's something we definitely need to find out What? how many salts are in your house. So this is going to be an awesome episode. Melissa Clark from the New York Times, Ben Jacobson from Jacobson Sea Salt, talking all about salt. Feeling salty, John. Yes. This episode is in partnership with the Chef's Warehouse and produced by Gotham Production Studios in New York City. All right, we are in the studio in New York City with Melissa Clark from the New York Times. Returning guest. Oh my God, this is her second time here. Yeah. I love it. I, I love the fact that I get to talk about like two things that I can't live about. Yeah. Anchovies was episode number one, and now we're back talking about salt. Salt. Who can live without salt? Nobody who cooks. Nobody who eats well. So, salt is as foundational as anything on this planet, for that matter. Well, right? absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it goes well, back 6,000 years. Just, like, you just made that up. Yeah, 6,000 what? Uh, it, the first uh, mention of salt was 6,000 BCE. Oh, oh. wow. Well, okay, you oh. didn't just make that up. I no, take it I back, look, Andrea. I, I, you you know, I did a little uh, Wikipedia this morning. <laughs> and what did they say back then? They that it's Salt, to Melissa's point, is like the foundation of the start of the planet. I mean, we could not exist in the world without salt. Yeah. It's, you know, and, it, and it's been like used, you know, throughout, you know, the coming to where we are now as like trade, um, 
you know, really important for disease and preservation. That's how it really started to preserve food. Yeah. That's how we're able to to eat. It was used as currency back Correct. very Salt blocks. a long, long time ago. And Melissa, you just had the opportunity to go to Portland, Oregon and out to the coast to visit our friend Ben Jacobson, who has Jacobson salt. What was that like? Well, you know, I'm I'm obsessed with flake salt in general, and I never really understood how it's made and how it's different from, say, fleur de sel or sel gris or any of the other like really fancy salts that I love to use on things. So seeing his process firsthand was it was just it enlightening. It was just enlightening. I learned so much. But it also made me want to go and see all the other production. I'm like, okay, well now I have to go see how fleur de sel is produced. So I need to figure out like that trip and I need to I'm like maybe I can go stop by Malden and <laughs> I just want to see where salt is made everywhere. I'm also interested in industrial salt. I want to see how, like, how does kosher salt become kosher? I mean, I've read how kosher salt becomes kosher salt, but I, I want, I'm interested in seeing the production, um, and hopefully I'm going to write an article about it for The Times, because I feel like people know how important salt is, and they're interested in the differences, but I don't know that we've really drilled into it in a, in a deep way, so. You know what's interesting? If you ever get the chance to have dinner with Melissa... And I, this happened the last week with another famous chef that I had dinner with. Melissa carries her own secret stash of salt in a little tin you with her tin? wherever oh, she always. goes. I have it in my purse. Always. And she you will, have to. Yes. She will open this up, and if something's a little under-seasoned, she'll give it a sprinkle. Absolutely. Because she's not messing to. around. Yeah. I mean, salt to me and seasoning is the most important thing in cooking. I mean, am I saying, is that an overstatement? No. I mean, it's, you can't have, I mean, I think it'd be really hard to have good cuisine without salt. You can have good food because some things don't need, it's not like every single thing you eat needs salt, but to make, to have cuisine, to have cooking, you need salt. And a lot of people, and I don't know if this is like a bad press or there, there was a, it seemed like maybe, I don't know, was it 15 years ago? Was it 20 years ago? Like salt is no good for you, putting too much salt on your food, high blood pressure, all these things that we heard. I like a lot of salt in my food. And sometimes even when friends come over, they kind of cringe when they see the amount of salt I'm putting into things. Is it possible, you know, and I'm not talking about over seasoning, but should we be watching the amount of salt we're using? Well, I think most of the salt that gives us um, that gives us high blood pressure that affects our health is um, in industrial, you know, processed foods, right? Because they're adding so much salt that you don't even understand. Like the amount that we, like when we take a big, huge pinch of salt and your friends are freaked out about it, is so small compared to the sodium content of, say, industrial produce potato chips right. or whatever like frozen dinners frozen dinners, right? Or even something like you know ice cream or mm -hmm. something like all, all the desserts that don't taste outwardly salty still have a high sodium content. So they're, they're two very different things. If you're cooking your own food and you're salting, especially if you're using, um, I mean, I really do believe um, in, you know, if you could get like um, a natural salt that has been minimally processed, you're going to be fine because it's adding a, so much flavor, so much salinity, and it's bringing out the other flavors. And it's, if it's too salty, you'll taste it. You know, your your tongue is a good guard against that. You know, we've all been um, <laughs> we've developed our sense of taste to want salt and sweet flavors. And at least with salt, I mean, I think with sweet, we can go, we definitely can go overboard. But when it's too salty, if you're cooking it yourself and you're using a natural product, you're going to taste it. Right. I'm curious as to what your guys' go-to salts are. What are you using at home? What do you, you know, are there any salts you don't use? Andrew, you go first. Okay. Then I want to hear Melissa. I'm curious. And how many salts do you keep in your house? I mean, I have a lot of different salts. I was actually, I just moved. So, you know, you're kind of taking inventory yep. of what do you want to take? What don't you? So in my salt pig um, on the counter is always diamond crystal kosher salt. That's like my everyday go-to salt. But then for finishing, I have a little thing of fleur de sel, which I love. It adds um, a little bit of crunch, which I like. I put it a lot on salads. Um, but that's strictly for finishing. I wouldn't use that in my everyday cooking. So that's the French crunchy sea salt. Yes. Yep. Um, and I also, to Melissa's point, I love a Maldon flake salt. Um, they almost look like little pyramids. Yep. And I think it's really great for visual and for crunch. Um, I did find a black uh, Hawaiian lava salt in my pantry that um, I remember I put it on like a ricotta crostini and it adds color. 
So, I mean, I'm a gray salt, a pink salt. I, I don't think I've met a salt. Maybe iodized, like the Mortons. I don't, I won't use that. Got it. So you got four or five salts yeah, in your oh, pantry. Yeah. What about Most you? The, yeah. Oh, no, I have like uh, at least 15. But a lot of them are flavored too. I mean, okay. I also have yep. you know salt with st- salt with added attractions. But in terms of um, just straight up salts, I probably have about a dozen. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I can tell you that I have three different kinds of four different kinds of flake salt, right? So like the malt and crystal. So mm-hmm. four different kinds of flake salt. I have at least three different fleur de sels. Then I have cell gris, fine cell gris, coarse cell gris. And so cell gris, and we can talk about the differences between all these salts, yeah, but sure. just to list, list them off. Then there's the Hawaiian salt. I also have the black salt. Mm-hmm. Um, I have, um, and then I have a couple of different kinds of kosher salts. And of course I have um, industrial fine sea salt as well, like the balen, I guess. It's yeah, yeah. La like the blue yeah. canister yep. and the red coarse one. Exactly, mm-hmm. I have both of those. And then I have a super, super fine salt for cheese making Ooh. that I, I just found the other day and, I'm, and I don't quite know what to do with it since I'm not making any cheese, but. <laughs> Like a fresh cheese, like a ricotta or? I, I bought it to play with mozzarella making, which okay. did not go anywhere in my kitchen. And it just kind of melts in because it's so fine. Yeah. Interesting. What about you, John? My, I am a diamond crystal kosher for all of my, let's say, seasoning, pasta water, um, throwing into a lot of cook, you know, preparations, whatever, I'm, I'm seasoning food. But then for finishing salt, I, I am a... Staunch Malden salt. I love it. I love the texture of it. I love crumbling it in my fingers and getting it onto dishes that way. Uh, fleur de sel, I love too for the crunch. Um, but I don't, I'm not into the like the colored salts so much, like the, the Hawaiian black or the pink sea salts. Um, you know, I have nothing against them. But for me, salt is very personal because the salinity levels are, are when you start messing around. I also do love the canisters, the blue and the red, La Belen. When I start playing with other salts, I don't quite have the same comfort level and I get fearful that I'm either going to under season or over season. Do you guys have that fear at oh, all? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, so when I'm developing recipes, right? So developing recipes, um, there's a whole you know question of should I be giving amounts of salt? Salt is so personal and every salt is different. But if you're learning how to cook, I do believe that you need amounts because to your point, People don't realize how much salt you need to salt something. And so they under season. I think new cooks under season. 100%. And then they're like, why doesn't this taste good? I'm like, because you didn't put enough salt in. So I need to guide them. But do I need to call for a brand? And so at the times we started calling, we say kosher salt and then in parentheses, the kind that the developer used, either Diamond or Morton's. Mm -hmm. Now, Morton's is actually more available in supermarkets across the country and Diamond is more of a restaurant thing. Um, and I use diamond, so we have to put it in. But Morton's is almost twice as salty as diamond. I was going to say, I find Morton's to be so salty. I always oversalt when I yes. use Morton's. Same. Agreed. But, 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 so then I've developed all these recipes that call for diamond crystal, but then there's a new diamond crystal. And we'll, so what do we do? So how do we, ch- I mean, so now I, I'm, I'm pulling my hair out and I decided that, you know what, maybe I'm going to start developing with fine sea salt or table salt, which is all because it's ground so Like fine. iodized salt? N- well, I'm not going to use iodized yeah. salt, but I think people do use it. So I, well, call- I was going to ask, like, do, are people still buying yeah. iodized well, that was, salt? That was a question I was going to ask both of you is growing up in your home, did you guys have the variety of salt that we're talking about right now? Because I know that in my house, my mom used to buy, I think it was Morton's, just that blue like canister round. of iodized salt. When it, and that was when it. When it rains, it still pours. Exactly. Did you guys have fancy salts growing up? I did not. Oh, I totally did. You did. Okay. Well, because I had you know fancy parents. Yes. Your parents so were traveling the world. And... They were, they were um, early adopters. I mean, we had, we always had a, we always used coarse sea salt on the table like we always had I always remember the salt grinder yeah wow and um, then when fleur de sel became a thing when was that in the 90s yeah fleur de sel was in 90s yeah so we had that in the 90s like my parents were on it Um, we did use kosher salt in the house probably because just Jewish Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) you know it's like oh that's the kosher salt but and we also had the salt and but we the salt in the salt shaker and then that was the we did have the Morton's so let's go back to that conversation about visiting Jacobson. What did you see there? What was that like? How was he making salt and how is it different? To, to, I mean, than we were there the in other September, places? John. Yep. Did you, were there things that you saw that you're like, wow, I didn't, had no idea because I know I was struck by certain things there. Yeah. Okay. So the things that really struck me was um, 
learning the difference between the the structure, how fleur de sel versus um, flake salt is made, because I wasn't really clear on that. I'm, and, and I mean, why does flake salt have that particular um, structure, right? And so learning about that, and I'm sure you guys have been talking about it, so you don't need me to explain it, but the cool, but the thing, so that was a cool lesson for me to learn. Um, and I was also struck by the m- amount of minerals, like the big chunks of, what was it, calcium mm-hmm. carbonate that yep. is just like, that comes out of it and, and how dis- just how that is actually in, it's not that amount because fleur de sel is, you know, it does get refined and it does lose a lot of its mineral content. I was always under the impression that you want minerals and salt. Like I've always loved cell gris. And I, st- I use cell gris a lot. Like when I make a stock, I put cell gris in because I want the complexity of flavor. Interesting. Always. Um, and um, it is, it's one of my basic cooking salts, not for developing recipes, but for my own personal cooking. But then when you, ta- but not for finishing salt. But then when I've tasted, so I went home, I, I learned about the mineral content and how in a flake salt, you do not want that because it's not, it's going to interfere with the texture. It's going to change the structure of the salt. And also, it it really makes it a it gives it a slightly bitter flavor, which I didn't I never focused on. So I went home and I taste and I did this with my family. I'm like I sat everybody down. I'm like, okay, people, let's. And my my daughter eats flake salt like potato chips. Like we have it on the on the table, and she just eats it. Like she puts it on everything and eats it out of hand. Bigger flakes, the better. So it's like a crunchy potato chip mm-hmm. without the potato. Exactly. Like who needs the carbs? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we um, we sat down and we all tasted. Um, a flake salt. Um, we didn't do was like a different different kinds of flake salt. Like we didn't taste Malden against Jacobson, and I also have Murray River flake salt from Australia. From, yeah, yep. from Australia. So we didn't do that, and I will do that. But I just wanted to get a broader sense of flake salt versus fleur de sel versus sel gris, and they're so different when you taste them by themselves. It's amazing, and you know there is a slight bitterness to fleur de sel that I hadn't register before. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't mind it in food. I love fleur de sel. Fleur de sel is great. But it is, it's like, it's noticeable when you taste these salts by themselves, which no, you don't really do. I mean, you don't eat salt, except for my daughter. You don't eat salt by itself, right? You're eating it in a thing. Um, But to understand what the flavors are, I think helps you make a decision on where to put things. And I really did get a, uh, a feeling of like, okay, so the purest, saltiest, but also briefest, it doesn't linger on your tongue. That's the flake salt. Then you have the fleur de sel, which has a, it's a little damper on the tongue. Mm-hmm. It's a little even, it's a damp crunch. As it appears to a wet crunch. too yeah, when you does. look at it. Yes. yes. And then it has a slight bitterness. And then the cell gris is the dampest and the crunchiest and also the most bitter. Um, and also a little metallic, like a slight metallic thing, uh, which again, in food doesn't bother me. But it was just really interesting because, you know, learning about the mineral content of all these and, and the cell gris you know, it gets its color not from minerals, actually, well, from clay, from where it's produced. Right. It's mm-hmm. a little bit of the clay that... Right. I think what you just described is actually very interesting because it has a lot to do with how these are produced. I'm by no means a salt expert, but when you're talking about flake salts, a lot of the flake salts, or Malden in particular, is actually baked in ovens. The water is brought in from these rivers in, in England and then put onto large trays and it goes into an oven... And it's very clean and pure, and then the salt, basically, the water evaporates, and then you're left with the salt. And the crystallization process where you get those pyramids and the flake shape is just a result of chemistry. I don't want to, I don't know more than that. But then, fleur de sel and coarse gray sea salt is done in these outdoor kind of uh, little flat areas where they block off the water source and then s- the sunlight actually dries the salt and, you know, as the water evaporates. And again, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, that very top layer is the fleur de sel or the flower mm-hmm. of the salt, and they rake that off. And this is done in France is where we all think of a lot of the production in the south of France, but it's also done in Sicily, um, the area around Trapani and other parts of the world. But below that top layer, and again, this is natural clay soil underneath when they continue raking you get that coarse gray sea salt and it makes perfect sense that it has a much more 
minerally clay flavor because it is absorbing that soil. That's my little yeah, dissertation no, have, have you, on salt. Have you ever seen it, John? Have you ever I have. Seen I've been to Tropany. I've been to southern France to see it. Malden's the one place I have not been, which I would love to see the way these ovens operate. And then this is very different. All of this, we're talking about sea salts. Then you have the kosher salts and the these other salts that come from like inside the earth. Yeah, and so I don't salt know mines, a whole salt lot. Mines, salt salt mines, mines, yeah. And I don't know a whole lot about those. Um, other than to say that they're mined from like even like you know the the mid the middle of the United States. Yeah, they're mined from you know um, salt reserves. So that's old, like basically billions of years bil- old, o- old oceans, former mm-hmm. oceans that yeah. are actually now just mineral mines full of salt, and they mine them using classic mining techniques. It's really dangerous. Oh yeah. Or that, and then they have newer methods where they pump water through them and then they get back brine and then they dehydrate the brine. So there's different ways to mine salt, but it's salt mining. It is, uh, you know, down in the salt mines, if you, you know, if that's like a prison sentence, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> do you ever cook um, on like the Himalayan blocks of salt? How do you, I've never, I'm not a huge fan of it, but I know it's I've popular. never done, I may have laid some like crudo on like a pink mm-hmm. block of salt, but again, I get scared when I don't know how the salt is going to affect the final outcome. I don't even, I don't like to mess around with that. But maybe if I had time to like test to it, test before, it out. before the guests came over, but. Uh, I don't yeah. know, I feel like I haven't done that yet. I ha- and I need to I need to do the cooking on it because I yeah. know that's a thing. Like you get it really hot and, mm-hmm. and maybe that's really good. I haven't like done, to your point, like I always, I never looked at it, it never appealed to me. I'm like, I don't know, it seems kind of kitschy. But I want to try it. See, see how it works. Right, like so raw the, versus like heating it. Yep. To John's point, like maybe a raw preparation, almost like if you're doing like a like a crudo, um, not in replacement of soy sauce, but almost sure. You know, adding that saltiness. Here, one of the things I've done differently with salt in recent years is whenever, let's say, I'm roasting vegetables in the oven, I would always, you know, listen, get the vegetables prep, cut however I'd like them toss them with olive oil, season with salt, put them in the oven. I stopped doing that after reading something somewhere where I, you know, and I, and after experimenting with this a little bit, I found that seasoning after the cooking or at the end of the cooking didn't, the salt has a way of making moisture leach out of the food. Right. Do you season things that are going in the oven all the time, you know, pre-season or is there ever a time where Salting at the end of the cooking process is better than doing it before. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I always, I always preseason. I mean, in my head, I'm like, oh, but it gets into the food better. But maybe that's not true. I mean, for for meat, for sure. Like for meat, yep. for fish, hundred percent. You want there's get... like a reaction between meat and salt, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, for anything, right? So salt's going to draw the moisture out, mm-hmm. and then if you salt ahead, the meat can absorb some of it back, right? And I agree hundred percent with the meat, but the vegetable thing is this thing. Where I need to try that. Try I've never, it. I've never I always, heard of that. I I read it. I want to say it was Andrew Carmelini in some article I saw where if the vegetables are not pre-seasoned when they're roasting in the oven, they tend to absorb their own moisture or I, maybe it evaporates and concentrates the flavor of the vegetable and then you season it at the end and it c- creates a better texture it's not as mushy and a more roasted kind of effect to it and you get the salt you know flavor because you've seasoned it later all right well obviously we're gonna have to do some we side by some side yeah. so that'll be fun all right let's talk about this because a lot of home cooks yeah um this is one of the ones where people cringe when they see me cooking at home how much salt do you put in your pasta cooking water? Oh, a huge amount. A ton. A, a full handful. Right? Yeah. I mean, I think when I first started, you know, cooking at home and, you know, in my teen years, I'd put like a tablespoon in and be like, that's a lot of salt. But then as, you know, you start to talk to people like Michael White and these other chefs, they're like, it should taste like the sea. And that's very salty for the most part. Yeah. Um, I put a lot of salt in the water, but here's one case, and I'm curious to hear what Melissa thinks. When you're making spaghetti or linguine vongole with clams, uh, do you ha, ever ha. get scared? Do you ever get fearful? Yes. Like, yes. how do you know how to control that salt level? 
because there's that natural salty brininess to the clams. Oh my God, clams are so, clams can be so salty. I have I've made clam dishes where I've added no salt. Right. No salt at all. And then, but they're still too salty. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you're just making steamed clams and you just yeah. put the, gar- and it's just too salty. So I have you just to never know what you're going to get with this. I know with the clams. So clams. Does are- purging them help? Is that, I mean, like, does anything help this? With the clams? Yeah. That's a good question about the, pur- but I purge them in salt water, don't you? I do. Because you're not fit. supposed to kill them. Yeah. Well, oh, they're already in the water when you buy them. Well, no, but I, w- I w- whenever I get clams, I take them. Oh, you them- purge them. Okay. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Do you I purge- take them, you put them in cold water, you add salt and you yeah. let the clams spit. Yeah. So they yeah, yeah. release any grit or yeah. sand. Right. Yep. Yeah. That's just one of the things that always I get when people come over my house and they want that. I don't mind if I overseason something and for it's you know, it's me and Lauren and we're having dinner at home. But if I have guests coming over It's your only opportunity to clams, season the pasta though. I know. But you know what? Here's the thing. I never, I, well, actually, it's not true. I've like, I never make pasta of all of Angolais for friends, but I did a couple of summers ago because we went clamming and I got all my old, I got like a hundred and some clams. It was so nice fun. Nice work. Yeah, it was very fun. And so then we made pasta of Angolais and, but it was okay. Luckily, I did not over season it. Everything was good. It was okay. But yeah, it's a fear. Have you ever seen the opposite though? Like, I have been, I've been invited to friends' houses for dinner and I watch them season the pasta like, chick, chick. Like two little shakes, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna have to eat that. Oh, I step like, right in there. Right, I'm yeah, like, yeah. um, maybe like a little more, but I don't want to be that like guest who's like taking over the kitchen. But you know, it's funny because when people invite, no one ever invites me over to dinner except for John. Um, yeah, just doesn't come. <laughs> Luckily, though. he's an amazing cook. Well, so. I'm, a, I'm sorry, you live like far away. If you didn't live I do. far, away. it is an hour. It's an hour to I get it. Um. But uh, yeah. Well, you've come over to my house and cooked. Yes. And you've made perfect pasta. Yes. So. And that's another thing we should talk about. This is this is not the truffle episode, but truffles and salt. Oh yes, you need another. You need salt on truffles. Truffles love salt. You need that, and you need to have a finishing salt on your truffle because even if you salt the pasta, you need finishing salt on the truffle, or it does not have as much flavor. I mm-hmm. th- that's like a big thing. Absolutely. I see, you know a lot of friends of mine. Oh, sorry, will buy you know, uh, spend a, an exorbitant amount on getting a precious white truffle to cook at home. And then they do everything right. And they finish the dish with the white truffles. And then sometimes they say, you know, it was good, but it wasn't as good as when I had it, you know, at this restaurant or I had it at your house. And the big difference mm. is you have to put a decent amount of salt to finish that dish. Yep. on the top, And that's another thing about f- finishing salt. I put finishing salt on almost everything. Everything. You know what I was, um, you know what Ben Jacobson said? Uh, he probably said it to you guys, but it was such a good thing. He's like, it's an affordable luxury. Like you mm-hmm. can just take bread and butter and you put salt on, good salt on top of it and it makes it better. So good. And it's just like anything, a peanut butter sandwich. Like I love to, ha- you know what I love? Banana, peanut butter, flaky sea salt or fleur de sel. Like yeah. to me, that's like just to have that, fin- you put it on your pizza from the pizzeria with your garlic powder and your finishing salt, and it makes a huge difference. It's it so will true. make anything better. All right, last subject, butter. Sorry. Is there a time <laughs> and a place for salted butter? Because I, and again, I'm saying at my home, unsalted butter is 99% of the use at my house. Really? You use, yeah, I rarely am using salted what? butter. And I love salted butter when it's- Wait, what, I don't understand. What do you put on your toast? Unsalted butter. What? Yeah, what? and I sprinkle a little you, salt do you on there. Salt on top. I do. You have to. All I right. Do. Well, why not just have salted butter? I don't know. I'm just asking. I love the Vermont Creamery, like the rolls oh, with the, the and because the, then you get you get the perceptible sea salt. You get crunch. that crunch. Yeah, yeah, love that too. That's I a like great, that. Great butter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really hard to find now. Why is that, John? I don't know the answer to that. It's I don't like know. I can't get it anywhere. We will find out for you. We're because find it's out. been there's like a it's like I've, in fact I've had a general like. Not many choices in my butters lately. Used to be you could get any kind of butter anywhere. I know that Land O'Lakes purchased them. Aha. Well, so they might be having COVID. They might be having distribution things because be. I can't I can't get that butter. Is there is salted butter something that you will use in specific recipes or is it always unsalted that you're using in cooking? Um again, just like we were talking about wanting to be able to control the salt. I will use unsalted butter in most cooking I do, but not all. You know, often one of my big, so this is one of my big um, secrets when I'm making pasta or vegetables or something like on the stove, I will take, because we always have 
salted butter in a butter keeper on the counter. So it's perfectly room temperature. It can we spread it. I mean, I eat that stuff on crackers, like Triscuits and salted butter is mm. just the best snack Heaven. in the world, right? So um, I keep that there. And then when I'm finishing a pasta or finishing some kind of sauce, that's what goes in at the end. Salted butter. Salted, softened butter. Great. Because it's also like, I don't want to take butter out of the fridge and put it in my pasta. And I don't have unsalted. So it's it's right there. And I really feel like it's also a really good, if I have salted butter on my counter, it's a really good quality. It's not just like the sticks of butter that I use for baking, which is also a good quality, but maybe not quite as high butter fat content, not quite as rich. So salted butter right at the end of the dish, along with more salt at the end of the dish. Like these are two ways. You know, it's funny when you're cooking, like all of these little things that I do, like the little tricks that I have that if I put them in a recipe, my recipe would be like 20 pages long. I'm Maybe like, you okay, a book about your little tricks. I know. I, I think about that. I'm like, but people will go. And then I'm like, and then you take this umami sauce that I have. And then you have the black garlic salt. You just add one teeny little pinch of that. And like all these itty bitty little things that I do yeah. that will make people insane. Like, when you were just saying that you add the salted butter to like vegetables, the first word that popped into my head was umami for some yeah. reason. Like just like adding that extra saltiness will bring out like the richness and the flavor of whatever you're cooking. Yeah. But that umami popped into my head. Yeah. And I mean, for, for pasta, I'll do it with like a marinara with it's like tomato and olive oil and I'll add butter and more olive oil, mm -hmm. like both, because they're different. And you know, one is mouthfeel and the salt and then the olive oil is like the, you hit it up with a really good olive oil at the end. You have both of those things yeah. going on. I'm going to confess to you guys, I was a little concerned about talking about salt for 30 minutes. Like, is there enough to talk about? I mean, I know it's so foundational. I feel like we could talk for two hours about salt. I feel like salt's like... Yeah, we didn't even talk about one. flavored salt. Oh, that I'm glad you said that because two weeks ago, our chef, David Walzog, mm -hmm. who does all a lot of our R&D and everything, came back with a jar of Jacobson's rosemary flavored sea salt did you try this i tried that when i was there and it was the best rosemary salt i've ever had it it's, it's like totally fresh different rosemary yes I'm i like sometimes against flavored salt me so too. you're gonna have to talk me into this one this one oh. oh i was okay so i completely agree with you that sometimes i'm against flavored salts mm -hmm. because well first of all i can't develop recipes with them because then you have to tell someone to buy a specific product because they're all different right, right. so this is something i use for my own personal cooking um and most and often like the stuff in there is stale it's yes. not that good. It's like, Correct. it's like it's just, but this fresh rosemary salt and I've had rosemary salts and herb salts and they always use dried mm -hmm. and this is just fresh. It, it's like, and I was making duck breasts a couple of nights ago and I didn't, and I was like, I want that. So I didn't have it yet. Um, actually I bought somebody, they were ship, they're shipping it to me. So it hasn't arrived. I'm like, I want that. Ro I, cause, Cause it's, it, it saves you the step of taking fresh rosemary, grinding it up with the salt, which is exactly is what it, it is. Is it wet or is it dry? It's wet. It is wet. It is and wet. It's, wet. And it's got a beautiful, vibrant green color. Yeah. If Listen, if you're listening to this, go to your gourmet shop. You're not going to find this at a big supermarket, but look for that Jacobson's rosemary salt because it is that good. I mean, I was blown away. We've long imported a rosemary salt from Italy. To your point, they use dry rosemary and maybe a few other herbs in there. It's good. This Jacobson stuff is like, wow. Next level. Yeah, I can imagine. I didn't get a chance, but finishing a steak with it would be just dreamy. Oh, oh my like God, lamb? like a Tuscan steak? Like yes. one of the, or lamb? A yes. Lamb. <gasps> oh. Yes. Yes. So, but, um, but what's fun about, so what's fun about what I like about seasoned salt. So I really like the ones that put that, um, I can use as shortcuts, right? So like the, like it has to be a super high quality or I'd rather just make, chop the rosemary up and, and grind the salt myself. But um, also like the black garlic salt, because black garlic is really hard to use. Like I'm not going to make a black garlic puree. I don't even love a lot of black garlic, but a little bit of black garlic and when it's in a salt. And um, I know that it's a common ingredient in a lot of the um, like Szechuan style mm -hmm. salts. Mm -hmm. Like you'll have black garlic along with Szechuan peppercorns. Yep. Um, I love those. Like I love the tingly different types of Szechuan or different Chinese salts. Um, those flavor combinations, a um, little star anise in there sometimes. Like To me, those are great shortcuts. And I put them in everything. I don't just use them in Asian cooking. I'll use those flavors, um, I mean, in everything. And just, you know, when you're sitting there over your dish and you're like, what does this need? Mm -hmm. And, you know, often the answer is just plain old good, you know, a pinch of really good finishing salt. Yep. But then to have the, to be able to play with the different seasoned salts, like that's just fun. I think that 
um, home cooks who are listening to this should really play around with salt because I think they could really elevate their food with one ingredient. Yeah. And they don't, and I don't think people realize the power that salt has in cooking. I really don't. So yeah. And it's the, like you, like the, the luxury, like you're going to yeah. pay. So you're going to pay $12 for like a little thing of salt and, and that's, you'll have it's it expensive. Forever. You'll have it for a really long time and it's going to add so much and it saves you work. Mm-hmm. This has been just an awesome conversation. I love when Melissa comes Melissa to Clark, chat with she, us. She's salt of the earth. Oh, she's the, oh, were you waiting right? to say that? All day. Was that I just, in your I was waiting. back pocket? I was that waiting. On the way here? I was reading it off this. I, I wrote it on my palm. Um, <laughs> we love having you as a guest. Thank you so much for coming in. Any other thoughts, Andrew? What do you want to talk about next? Yeah, oh. when are you coming back? Well, God, I mean, lemons and garlic. Can we talk about those? Garlic. I think last time we had uh, Melissa on, she had written 40 cookbooks. Where are you yeah. at today? Is there another book coming out? Do you have it? What's going on? I'm writing a really big book. It's taking forever, and it's not going to be out till 2025. Wow. What is, can you tell us? Um, all about little salt. Sneak peek. It's all about salt. No, but I use, I will have to have a salt, like, thing of explaining um it is it's um it's a teaching cookbook and it's it's helping people you know nice. really understand how recipes work and it's going to be a basics cookbook with all the recipes you need all the techniques not all the techniques not all the recipes but it'll give you a good foundation um good for beginners but also good for seasoned cooks because it'll also show you how to take your recipes to the next level andrea christmas 2025 you know what to get me you got it you know you're getting one for free. What are you oh, talking thank about? Thank you. I just sign up. I <laughs> like you can get, you can get oh, me one. I just one want then. Andrew to buy me something. <laughs> thank you, guys. This was awesome. All about salt. All right. Where? First of all, Andrew, where are we today? We are oh. on or at the Oregon coast. Yeah. We're at Jacobson Salt with Ben Jacobson here. Where are I know we drove a little ways. We Where, drove an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes from Portland. Windy roads, stunning trees. We passed oyster farms. Tillamook is the town. Yes. We, it, this is a beautiful part of the world. Um, we're staring out right now at this gorgeous bay. I can see what looks like sand dunes covered in tall grasses. There's birds in the water. And the sun is shining. I think out of all the episodes we've ever done, this is the most beautiful place we've ever recorded. There's without a doubt. Without a doubt. Ben, you win. Ben Jacobson, oh. the founder of <laughs> Jacobson Sea Salt. Welcome. Thank you very much. Talk to us about this incredible salt that you're making. How did this start? I mean, first first off, thank you for coming out. Um, not only to Oregon, but also all the way out here to Knee Tarts. Uh, it means a lot to us as a small company, and we're really appreciative of it um, and appreciative of your partnership, too. You mean a lot to Chef's Warehouse, so well, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, I found out about Good Salt when I was uh, living in Denmark. Uh, I lived there for about two and a half years, and after that I moved to Norway for about two and a half years. And... Um, my girlfriend at the time in Denmark brought home a package of good salt, and I was blown away by how much better it was than anything I'd ever tasted. And, you know, my mom did most of the cooking growing up, and my mom was a fantastic cook, but she wasn't a cook that used great salt. Um, and I think that's, you know, I don't think she's alone in that. I think most of America still doesn't know about, know the value of using great salt every single day, every single meal. And so I was just blown away by how much better something so sim something so simple, uh, but also essential um, was and could be than any anything I'd ever tried before. And so from that point on, I kind of became a f just obsessed and fascinated with salt. And um, moved to Norway, got a job there, and I was traveling around the world, uh, which was great. It was fun and it was a great job, but. I would always, you know, you know, on a work trip, you always have, you know, half hour here, or half hour there to go and explore. And I did. And I um, sought out these little kitchen shops all around the world and tried to find salt from each region. Um, be, and because it was just a fun thing to bring back that reminded me of where I was, um, but also reminded me of, of um, you know, it brought you back um, to a taste perspective to that area. And so I moved back to Oregon um, and have been here for, you know, on and off for, I went to high school here and have been here on and off for 20 years. But 
started to look around and um, realized that nobody in America was making great finishing salt. And I was blown away by that fact. And um, so I, at that point, I started really just kind of tinkering. Um, and I would come out to knee tarts on the weekends. I would go kayaking and oftentimes drop crab pots um, in the bay and usually didn't catch anything. But um, at the end of each trip, I would, I would usually fill up a gallon or two of, of, of seawater. And, um, and then I brought it back to, the, to my kitchen in Portland and started making salt. Um, obviously making salt, you can make salt in infinite ways. Um, it's some, it's obviously some combination of reduction of seawater. Um, I think my first attempt ever at making salt, I, you know, those little kiddie pools, those plastic kiddie pools. Mm -hmm. I put one on my back patio and filled it with salt water and then walked away for like three months (laughs) and nothing (laughs) happened because in Portland in the summertime, while it's hot, it's not hot enough for extended period of time to make that happen. Um, so knew it had to involve some sort of heat. And so I spent the next two and a half years after that trying to figure out how to make great salt and do so consistently and finally did. Um, and then once I figured that out, I said, all right, well, this is going to be a little bit more than an extensive hobby, but might as well figure it out. So, um, I then went and tested 27 different spots of seawater along the Northern Washington coast, all the way to the Southern Oregon coast. And looked at a map before I did to find what I thought might be the best um, bays, inlets, um, protected coves, that sort of thing. And um, and then uh, went and got seawater from each and every one of those, made salt from each and every one of those, and then um, finally settled on on Neatarts Bay here, uh, which is, you know, arguably the cleanest the cleanest bay on the west coast of America. It's a protected marine estuary. Uh, we have two freshwater inlets here, one of which is seasonal. So you have very little freshwater runoff. Um, and you combine that with the fact that tens of millions of oysters are farmed here. And um, you end up really with this perfect storm of, um, of salt making conditions. So we have exceptionally high um, salinity levels for the Oregon coast, pre filtered by oysters in a protected marine estuary. And um, Started sourcing water here for the first two and a half years of the business. I was driving rented U-Haul trucks um, back over the coast range with uh, filled with um, with totes of seawater, which is clearly not effective or efficient. But when you're starting a business and you have no capital, that's just you got to figure it out. Um, and um, we, you know, after a couple of years, we we're able to get this spot right here where we are now, um, and it's been great. Um, and it's changed a lot since then uh, but we are we're a small young company and we're in constant evolution and we are not um, married to any process with the exception of the salt making process and making it better each and every time we're not married to um, you know inertia and uh, and and the old way of doing things we are constantly innovating and evolving but let's talk about the different types of salt you guys are making. Because not all yeah. salt is created equal. Yeah. Not all salt is created equal. And, and, you know, salt became commoditized in the Industrial Revolution in the U.S. And at that point, Americans never really looked back. But oftentimes we should look back to look forward and, and figure out our path. And whereas every other country on the planet, nearly every other country on the planet, has salt that is special to them. Um, but Americans kind of, you know, turn their back and never look back. Salt is one of those ingredients that, you know, America kind of forgot about um, for decades. Um, of course, we were using it, but we forgot about the importance of it. And, um, and you know, a flake, a flake, a high quality flake salt like Jacobson can transform a dish. It's not only, of course, the salinity, but it's also a nice textural contrast. So when you look at that, if you had, were lucky enough to have brunch at Canard um, and you had that uh, beautiful, beautifully executed French omelet topped with flake salt from Jacobson, that, you know, the creaminess and softness of the eggs with a delicate crunch, not a thick crunch like some salts can be, but a really delicate um, crunch uh, is just, it's sublime. Um, or Khan restaurant in Portland, arguably the top, most talked about restaurant opening in America with Gregory Gourdet as a chef. And you know, he uses Jacobson exclusively and he uses it on everything. Um, but 
um, primarily, obviously, to finish with. And um, so we have our pure flake finishing salt, of course, and then we have our kosher salt. And kosher salt is, of course, used for cooking, brining, baking, braising, boiling, um, and our flake salt is used to finish. Awesome. And what about the honey next to you? Absolutely. So um, our honey, um, we uh, bought a very small honey company um, called Be Local about seven years ago, eh, six years ago now. And um, they were not doing super well, but we brought them under the wing, um, reduced their cost tremendously because they weren't paying rent, which was nice, um, and, um, and started scaling up their honey operation. I think when we bought Be Local, they were attending 25 hives. We now um, have a beekeeper that's managing 135 hives, and her name is Emily Schmeidel, and she's incredible. She's a, a literal master beekeeper. And is um, she in, in she, Oregon? She's in Oregon, okay. yeah. Okay, how absolutely. far from here? Uh, she lives in Portland. Oh, okay. Uh, so 80, 85 miles from here. Okay. Um, and, you know, our honeys are, are all single origin. Um, we don't blend or heat treat any of them. Um, I'll let you taste through all of them. Sure. The one that I think that's the most unique is this buckwheat honey. Um, and I should back up a little bit too. The reason we kind of got into the honey business was more just because we were already working with great chefs and those great chefs and restaurateurs and retailers were also buying honey. And so um, that's why we, and it, honey is also an elemental ingredient. It's it's not one that, it's not like, like we're selling uh, packaged manicotti <laughs> in addition to flake salt. Sure. Right. And yeah. I think now the Jacobson brand is so recognized by the best chefs in America, it's it's something they can trust, and there's great transparency with these products, which is really important to chefs everywhere. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about the salt, the actual salt making process. Yeah. So you you mentioned the oysters, which they essentially are doing the first filtration for us, for you, um, and then you have the the pipe that goes, you know, brings the water into the the, the factory. I guess walk us through the next steps. Yeah, absolutely. So we. We pump seawater in through a very underwhelming but very uh, efficient two-inch PVC line, um, and um, we store the seawater on site. Um, we store about a week's worth of seawater on site just in case there's you know tides where we can't pump or what have you. At that point, we move it um, um, into our boil shed, and our boil shed removes the volume of the seawater, of course, but most importantly, removes the calcium and magnesium. Um, that would otherwise stay in the salt. And you saw that when um, mm -hmm. we picked up a hot piece of that uh, calcium. And that calcium is the same calcium that oysters would build their shells out of. And which is great, but if you can imagine that also in your salt, it's not going to add anything to it necessarily. And so what we wanted was exceptionally clean and briny um, and delicate flakes with no bitter aftertaste whatsoever. And so we pair that calcium and magnesium back scales to the bottoms of our pots um, and at th that point we remove the um, we we transfer the brine um, to very shallow stainless steel evaporation pans and all of our equipment um, John you mentioned this earlier is it's not like we can buy off-the-shelf equipment it's all custom made unfortunately um, and I'm by no means an engineer or fabricator and so it's been uh, a very expensive journey to figure out um, but, uh, but, you know, this accumulated um, knowledge base um, it has, has definitely begun to kind of add up. How did you learn? How, I mean, it's not like you can yeah. go to the university and say, I want to get a degree in salt production. How did you learn this? Uh, literally trial and error. It was a lot of failing, frankly. Um, I made, I've made a, hundreds of batches of bad salt. Um, and by bad salt, I mean, yes, of course, they're still edible. But... It's not the salt we I was looking for. You wanted finishing salt, like the beautiful pyramid flake absolutely, salt. Absolutely, absolutely. And wasn't going to sell for or settle for anything less. And to illustrate that fact too, you know, we were sitting on um, close to 100,000 pounds of our kosher salt, mm -hmm. and um, which is made in the exact same manner as our flake salt, but I didn't want to try and pass it off as, as flake salt. Um, and I could have, certainly, but it would have, in my mind, compromised the quality and the brand and the integrity of what we're trying to do every single day. And so we didn't. And then all of a sudden, a light bulb went off and we were like, oh, 
let's sell kosher salt. So we got a kosher certification, pretty straightforward, mm -hmm. um, and put it in a package. And so there we are now. Nice. So and you were saying that for every gallon of water, it produces four ounces of salt. Only one ounce is flake and the rest is kosher? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's 120 ounces of water in a gallon. So, I mean, not that much for the yeah. flake salt. Yeah. It for, is very special. Yeah, it's it's exceptionally special. Um, you know, we um, it's definitely a, a small percentage of what uh, of the total salt that we produce. Um, and if we could flip that around, we certainly would. Sure. Um, but uh, but that's also what makes it special. Um, and hopefully chefs and, and, you know, home cooks like myself um, kind of understand that. And, and it's special, but it's also not something that should be precious. And that's the other thing I'd like to try and talk about, too, is great salt shouldn't be just saved for the special occasions. Um, great salt should be used every single day. And, you know, when you're talking about a $55 chef jar in, in my house, uh, I, I buy salt, um, buy Jacobson salt. And in my house, um, I buy, you know, about one chef jar every six months. Um, and so it's $55. That's going to last me, you know, two a year. So I'm spending about a hundred dollars a year on salt. And whereas before I was spending probably five to ten dollars a year on salt um and yes that's a huge difference that being said the you know the the price per use is effectively is, is pennies. nominal it's yeah. pennies yeah one thing that you mentioned earlier when we were walking around visiting the beautiful bay is that you know i, I use the word terroir and you said meroir you know which is a really a, a specific flavor for for the salt or for things coming out of uh, this bay in Oregon. Is there something, is there a way you describe Jacobson salt as far as the flavor profile, or as far as the salinity? And how does that differ from other salts that people may know? Yeah, I like the oyster reference that you used in that example. Yeah. I mean, so uh, with every single batch of salt that we make at Jacobson, um, we're striving for um, three primary characteristics, which are taste, texture, and color. With taste, um, we want the salt to be exceptionally briny and clean with no bitter aftertaste. Um, and you can very distinctly tell that uh, with other types of salts with a bitter, with a bitter aftertaste. Um, oftentimes, um, people will describe our salt as sweet, um, which is totally odd right. because it's salt. Because it's salt. Um, but um, the salt does, our salt definitely does have a sweet quality to it. Um, and that's a direct uh, result of our pairing back that calcium and magnesium. So are there specific uses for the different types of salt? Absolutely. Um, generally, you know, our flake salt is used to finish. And that's, of course, because, you know, you, you add the salt on top, which is going to, you're going to taste more of that salt rather than if it was integrated into the, I made polenta last night. And I, instead of, I put a little bit of salt in while I was cooking, but then when I served it, I put salt on top. I finished it with salt. And so you end up using the same or less total salt, um, but you end up tasting it more. And you end up you end up with the textural contrast as well as a finishing salt. Um, so I would say, you know, finishing salt or flake salt is great for finishing a kosher salt um, where, this, where the crystals are smaller, um, brining, baking, boiling, braising, um, where you're not gonna, got, not gonna tell that textural uh, difference. Um, is, is generally a good rule to go by. Yeah, one of the things that I've often talked to chefs about when they're using flake salt, and I've experienced this when I'm at home cooking as well, is the texture. If you've never used it before, these are little pyramids when we talk about flake salt. And I love that tactile aspect of crunching it between my fingers, kind of grinding it as I'm putting it over a dish, and almost getting it to the kind of consistency that I want for that. You mentioned the, you know, the omelet at Canard where you have this light crunch and there's different times where you may want more crunch texturally or you may want something that really is fine. And that to me, it's, I just love rubbing the salt between my fingers and getting it to that certain graininess. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's honestly, it's fun and it's, it feels good when you're cooking texture or cooking is a, is a sensor sensorial experience, right? You're smelling, you're tasting, you're listening. Um, and you're, and you're touching the ingredients that you're cooking with. And, 
um, and it's fun to manipulate them uh, as you see fit. And it's... Yeah. It feels good. Well, Andrea loves to do this in front. You know, she'll. If, I don't know if you've ever seen her Instagram, but she. We call her the Salt Bay. Um, she loves to just kind of crunch it up and let it roll off her elbow. <laughs> I think I feel like I've seen you've Instagram seen videos got, about mm, that. Yep. Yeah, Salt Bay uh, Junior over here. Salt Bay Two. <laughs> yes. <Is> that- <laughs> no, I. I love using flake salt. Um, two like my two top ways. Oh, so I you would said say. Salt I'm Bay, but I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love. Um, when you're slicing a steak and using the crunchy flake salt on protein, that's like my favorite. On the when you when you're slicing the steak and then you turn it to on the bias and Correct. then you put the the flake salt on the actual, like the inside. Uh, the, uh, yes, Andrea actually travels. I experienced this during our road trip here in California and Oregon. She travels with her own portable tin of Jacobson of salt. Jacobson salt. And she's not shy about whipping that out and insulting a chef or anybody. <laughs> when she needs salt, she gets her salt. And she opens that little tin and she sprinkles it right there in the middle of the kitchen, which I love, or the dining room, which I love. Um, there it is. On, on yeah. cue, oh. Mr. Rob Metnick yeah. Thanks, Rob. delivers the slide tins. Oh, thank so, you. Yeah. And you're not the first person I've seen to bring salt to. You know, salt is, let's face it, it is the most important ingredient in a kitchen, mm-hmm. bar none. It brings do we, all agree, do we all agree with that yeah. statement? Uh, I'll, I'll even add to that too and say it's the only mineral that humans cannot survive without. This has been amazing. It's been beautiful. It's been eye-opening. Um, I don't want to leave. Cannot this is thank incredible. You we love Jacobson. Thank you so much for your partnership. You all have been uh, with us from the early days. Um, I know we're opening up new markets with you now too. Um, and, um, we are so grateful for you and, and your support of small, high quality food and food processors and, and manufacturers. Yeah. We've said this before. It's producers like you that make the chef's warehouse who we are, who make Provista specialty foods, who we are here in Oregon. And so thank you for doing what you do and just amazing. Thanks, Ben. Heck yeah. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Ingredient Insiders. You can watch this episode on YouTube and see more behind the scenes content by following us on Instagram by searching at Ingredient Insiders. 